All right, Mick, welcome to the Lowy Institute. It's great, great to have you here. Thanks, mate. It's a pleasure. Um, the first thing I wanted to do was thank you personally for the contributions you made to yeah. the interpreter earlier this year on the 10th anniversary of the Iraq war. I got the sense at the time when we communicated by email mm. that that was, that was hard to do for you. Oh. Those pieces were hard to write. Oh. Tell me why. Incredibly so. Well, I mean, you know, all up I spent between six and seven years in Iraq. Mm. And that wasn't rotating in and out. That was what, 11 months a year back to back. And then I thought I would sprinkle that with the Israeli invasion of Lebanon, the Russian invasion of Georgia, and then my network's reward for all of that was to assign me to cover the Mexican cartel drug wars. So the 10th anniversary of the war, like other certain events, it different, f flushed a lot of stuff up. And like any of our diggers, like any of the 2.4 million Americans who've served at least one combat tour, Right, the Iraqis themselves who are now growing up into adulthood who have witnessed all those, mm. it's a lot to come to terms with. So writing that piece wasn't something I went looking for, um, but it turned out to be a very useful and cathartic exercise. So mm. in the end I actually owe you one. <laughs> Not at all, no, we owe you, so do the readers. Now those, the, the, the two articles that you wrote looked at the, the origins of the uh, insurgency mm -hmm. in Iraq, but I imagine you've maintained some of the contacts that you established in Iraq at the time. Mm -hmm. And I wonder when you talk to people, when you talk to those people now, what do they say about the, the direction of Iraq now? Where, where's it going? Well, it, it's, it's going where it's always been almost since immediately after the invasion. It's an extension of Iran. Uh -huh. um, and in fact, this is, this is actually the most salient topic in my view of the entire Iraq war. It's the two great ele or greater elements of it is one that through the Al-Qaeda leader in Iraq, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, mm -hmm. we saw a revolution within Al-Qaeda of its own definition of itself. So effectively, the work of this Al-Qaeda in Iraq leader has given us a new generation of Al-Qaeda across the planet who are far more brutal, who are far more menacing and far less merciful than anything that Osama, Osama bin Laden himself intended. As we saw throughout the war, Osama bin Laden, um, uh, Ayman al dwahri even Abu Musab al zarqawis Islamic mentor still in a Jordanian prison, all urged him publicly to tone down the killings, mm. particularly of Muslims, and he will just keep ramping it up each time. So there's that revolution with Al-Qaeda, there's our gift of the Iraq war. Mm -hmm. But the real outtake of the Iraq war is that Iran was the winner. Now, there's not a single US ambassador who served in Baghdad who disagrees with that. Mm. Um, there's certainly not a general who disagrees with that. Because what we didn't realise at the time, in 2003, as those first coalition tanks pushed north across the Kuwaiti border and started charging towards Baghdad, with every success as they went further and further north, greater and greater was the vacuum left behind them. Mm -hmm. At the same time, coming from the east, there was between 30 to 50,000 um, Iraqis who'd taken refuge in Iran, fleeing Saddam's regime, but who, who had been incorporated into the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. So effectively, as we push through, say, a town like Kut in the south, you then see the Iranian intel traffic that says, right, we are now in control of the town. The Brits have arrived, but we, we've got a new governor, we've got the new chief of police, we've got the new... Mm. So there was an, an Iranian invasion as well, mm. a soft invasion. And while we try to operate on the dime principle, you know, diplomacy, intelligence, um, economics, they did too, but they did it far more effectively than us. So while the, say, Americans sponsored a television channel and a newspaper or two and a couple mm -hmm. of... The Iranians did it on mass. Dozens of radio stations. Every university in the South was flooded with Iranian mullah. Mm -hmm. um, women suddenly had to start covering up. It was both Shia and Sunni who brought extremist Islam to, a, to a, an Iraqi nation that was largely secular yeah. until we invaded. 
So at the end of the day, I mean, they're, sadly, they're the greatest outtakes from Iraq. And what people tell me now is that obviously with events in Syria, mm. now the, 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 Sunni, the Sunni fear has always been that Iran's intention was to complete what they called the, 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 the sheer line of influence or the, the, the sheer circle between Iran through Iraq to Syria mm -hmm. into Lebanon to the Mediterranean. And now it's not too hard to argue that they have effectively achieved that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is the legacy of the Iraq war. And let me take you back to the first point about a, uh, it seems a more, a fiercer uh, Al Qaeda. Mm -hmm. That c cuts against the general narrative that you hear, and it, even from the US president himself, who says that Al Qaeda is in decline, is far less of a threat today than it was. So you, how do you reconcile those two things? Well, I'm yet to encounter an American president who ever actually knew what was really going on on the ground anyway in Iraq. But with the greatest respect to the president, I mean, he's right and he's wrong. OK, what have we done to Al-Qaeda? All right, with the invasion of Afghanistan, we forced them to displace. They no longer had their mm -hmm. training camps. But that dispersed them. But let's not forget, Al-Qaeda was waiting for that. What people... I find tend to neglect is that September 11 did not begin on September 11, it began on September 9. Mm -hmm. Osama bin Laden and Al Qaeda, knowing obviously what they were going to do in New York, realised that the first thing the Americans do would come and invade Afghanistan. They knew that if for America to do that, they would have to look for anti Taliban allies. Mm. And the only man left standing at that point, the only warlord, was Ahmed Shah Massoud. Yeah. So two days before, the 9-11 attacks, Al-Qaeda assassinated Ahmed Shah Massoud so that America wouldn't have that man to immediately turn to. Hmm. Al-Qaeda knew it was going to disperse. It's a covert organisation that's compartmentalised and is built for loss. Mm -hmm. Their ability to regenerate at all levels, I mean, they've lost you know, their, their leader himself, they've lost senior strategists, mid-ranking commanders, untold foot soldiers, and yet we still live with Al-Qaeda. Mm. Now, could they do another 9-11? It's entirely possible. Do they have the same, the same sanctuary that they once had that helped lead to 9-11? No. But look at North Africa. Look at the so-called Arab Spring. I mean, that is such a fallacy. I mean, with all these revolutions we're seeing through the Arab world and in, and in North Africa, the greatest beneficiaries, again, have been the religious extremists. Mm. So it's not the same Al-Qaeda it was when Stuart, President George W. Bush commenced the so-called wars on terror. They don't pose the most immediate threat to America that perhaps they once did, but to mm. think that they're gone is, is a, is, again, is a falsehood. And just finally, Mick, given you're here today for the New Voices mm -hmm. conference, I want to ask you what your advice is to young people who are thinking about embarking on a career in journalism, particularly who have uh, maybe slightly romantic ideals about being a foreign correspondent. Oh, absolutely. Well, my simple advice would be, would be don't do it. Mm. <laughs> I mean, look, let's be frank, you know, Economically, the world is going through an enormous transition. Mm. And the media world in particular um, is, is both at the tip of that change, but is also being crushed and rolled over by it. The way I look at it is, you know, it's like we're trying to invest in horse and buggies while Henry Ford is rolling out Model mm. Ts. There's been a, a technological revolution with Twitter and the internet and all this was, and the instant, the instantaneous nature now of news and reporting and, and citizen journalism and all these things. But those people can't do what you did. Right? No, no, they can't. No, they can't. And, but, and there's a valuable role for, mm -hmm. for citizen journalism. Mm -hmm. um, but equally, there retains, perhaps even greater than before, a need for professional journalists. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a, it's a never shrinking world, though. Newspapers and, and print, as we know, is struggling for its very existence. And yet, so far, no one yet has figured out how to properly commercialise the internet. <laughs> so, we are in one of the greatest crises in journalism, certainly in my two decades. Um, I, I think in, in several generations. 
I'm confident we'll find our way through all of this and I'd like to believe we'll be better and stronger. Mm. But the journalism of the future, I think, will not resemble anything that we're currently familiar with now. Mm. Mick Weir, thanks for your time. Digger, pleasure. Good on you. Great.